Good evening. My name is Tony Booth, and I'm one of the founder members of Friends of the River Cam, which is hosting this event. It's great to see so many people here. You're all very welcome, whatever your views, and we welcome all questions and comments in a spirit of dialogue. Friends of the River Cam is a non-party political alliance of a number of groups. You can find our charter on the website we're developing, friendsofthecam.org. We're committed to restoring the health of the river and its precious chalk streams in flow and in quality. We're unfunded and will take no money from any organization that supports the high emissions, unsustainable growth in our area that is putting such pressure on the river system. This evening, we're going to be hearing about the Oxcam Arc from Professor David Rogers. The Oxcam Arc is a vast development of building and infrastructure across five counties between Oxford and Cambridge, but effectively stretching between Felixstowe to the east coast and Southampton to the south. This is part of what the government calls its Build, Build, Build program, eagerly supported by developers, estate agents, Cambridge University, the consortium of business interests in Cambridge Ahead and councillors of most parties. Cambridge has the look of a gold rush city with its many giant cranes on the skyline and for the few who will benefit, that's just what it is. The Oxcam Arc is our region's HS2, and it should be stopped. In a post-pandemic world, subjected to climate and biodiversity breakdown, current development plans seem anachronistic. The slogan that greets visitors to the Greater Cambridge Partnership website growing and sharing prosperity, borrowed from central government description of the arc, looks like something out of the 1950s. We have a huge task on our hands to minimize the looming chaos which will be wrought by climate breakdown and biodiversity collapse. And we need our representatives not to bury their heads in the past. It's not just a matter of paving paradise, destroying biodiversity and the overstretching of our finite water supply, which will result in the destruction of our river. The massive use of cement and concrete to support build, build, build will make a major contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. Cement manufacture contributes 8% of global carbon emissions which is more than three times the impact of flying. Iron and steel production accounts for another 5%. In six years at the present rate, we will have used up all the carbon budget were allocated to reach zero carbon by 2050 in this region. So for these reasons too, all unsustainable growth has to be curbed. It's been said that there is a strong anti-growth lobby in Cambridge. Those opposed to unsustainable growth have almost no power compared to the consortium of business and developer and Cambridge University interests lobbying in the opposite direction. So we're going to have to pull off the almost impossible to bring some realism to planning in our area and we are determined to do it. I'm going to pass over to Wendy Blythe, Chair of the Federation of Cambridge Residents Associations, who will introduce David Rogers. Tonight, we're delighted to welcome David Rogers, Professor of Ecology at the University of Oxford and Secretary of the No Expressway Group to talk about the environmental impact of the Oxcam Arc. Following a successful campaign that took the No Expressway Group and others to Westminster with a petition that had cross-party support from Cambridge's MP Daniel Zeitner, Oxford's MP Lila Moran and Buckingham's MP Greg Smith, the controversial Oxford-Cambridge Expressway was cancelled in March. However, 
the government still aims to increase economic output of the Oxford to Cambridge region with 1 million extra jobs and 1 million houses, with Cambridge's share, 271,000, increasing by more than 80% the entire housing stock of the county. I first encountered David at a Westminster Forum in 2018, where the presenters talked about maximizing this area's economic potential. They described the business opportunities of the Oxcam Mark as ecosystems. No one mentioned climate change or the biodiversity emergency. There was nothing said about the Arc's contribution to air pollution, climate breakdown, resource consumption, or water use or sewage. David pointed out that he was an ecologist and that natural ecosystems are self-sustaining and supportive and they do not destroy themselves. Attempting to green the arc, he said, is like putting lipstick on the pig. As a distinguished ecologist, who better to tell us about the environmental impact of the arc and what selling nature and nature name of a setting means? Over to you, David, thanks. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, in 2019, when we used to um, give talks at villages across the Ark, uh, the villages had to turn out on a wet night, a cold light like tonight, to go to a drafty village hall and sit and listen to us talking. Um, at least now I can thank you for moving from your dining room table to your sofa for tonight's talk. Thank you very much. Now, in this talk, I'd like to explore some of the work we've done at this end of the Ark, the Oxford end of the Ark, uh, probably the Wild West from Cambridge's point of view, looking at the proposals for Ox Camark development. The first message I want to give you, despite what the government says, is the Ox Camark really isn't unique. There are other places in the UK, I'm going to show you some, which are equally suited for this level of development and quite frankly more in need of it and more capable of absorbing it. The trouble with ARC thinking to date is it's been very silo based. We've had the Ministry of Transport, the Ministry of Housing, the Department of Business and so on. And it's certainly, there hasn't been adequate communication between them. It's been silo based thinking. In the process, nature is being commodified. It's being traded. At present, for example, funds will only be available for the arts nature in exchange for development. No development, no funding for nature. It's a quid pro quo. And unfortunately, the techniques being used in this trade, biodiversity net gain, natural capital accounting, are either deeply flawed or they concentrate on only one part of the whole picture. And I'll try to explain that in the talk. These flaws lead to an incorrect valuation or an undervaluation of the nature across the arc. Human wealth is the sum of both stocks and the yields of human, natural and economic capital. And they shouldn't be measured by just one component of one of those three, such as gross domestic product, GDP, which has dominated and driven economics in the last century. Habitat fragmentation across the arc is very, very severe. In fact, the average size of many protected habitats is about that of a rugby pitch, one hectare. Doubling nature in this situation is going to be very, very difficult and almost certainly impossible if it only occurs as a quid pro quo for development somewhere else. So let's have a look at what's the plans involved. Well, the Ark started life as a donut. The idea of a golden donut around London uh, was born in the early years of this century. And you can see the donut is outside London's green belt, but with an easy commuting distance of the capital city. The donut was effectively a dormitory donut for London commuters, that was the suggestion. And then in about 2005, people identified key towns in that donut, London, Oxford and Cambridge. So this was the lock, the Golden Triangle, still dependent on the radial routes out of London, of both, of course, roads and rail. And then in 2016, the National Infrastructure Commission looked at east-west links rather than radial links from London and came up with the idea of the arc, the Oxcam arc between Oxford and Cambridge. And of course, stretching in each direction, Felixstowe in your direction and onto Newbury and the West in our direction. Effectively, the arc is the outer M25. And the significance of that is it needed to carry freight. It needed to decant 
some of the freight from the overcrowded M25. So that's how the Ark was born. It was born as uh, uh, the product of a donut. Now, the key document describing the Ark, the playbook for the Ark, effectively at the present time, is the National Infrastructure Commission's Partnering for Prosperity document produced in 2018. And it had five pillars for the development of the region. And it's probably best to start at the bottom here, the 163 billion increase in economic output. This was the economic prize. And then that involved uh, creating a million new jobs, a million new houses, the Oxford Cambridge Expressway and East West Railway. All of those five pillars. Now, as when you remark, the Oxcam Expressway was recently canceled and it should never have been suggested in the first place. It still leaves four pillars and the economic ambitions remain exactly as they were before. Contributions to the Partnering for Prosperity document came from several different ministries, from uh, Cambridge Econometrics, for example, from Savills House Builds, from Highways England and so on, and from Network Rail for the East West Railway suggestions. And after it was produced, other ministries got involved with the Department of Business Studies, Housing, England's Economic Heartlands, and then the collection of art universities, the yellow document there, and finally the Nature uh, Charities, NGOs, the Wildlife Trusts, the Woodland Trusts, and the RSPB. And of course, property developers were not cold to the fact there was huge development opportunities in the ARC itself. And I'm forced to point out that other property developers are available, but there's incredible interest because building a house in the south of the country provides two to three times the profit of building a house anywhere else in the country at the moment. Let's look at one of the first myths, the myth that the Oxcam Arc is unique, that there is no alternative. Um, there isn't any alternative because the NIC didn't look at any alternative. It gave us the Oxcam Arc, it didn't look at the alternatives. But it already had in its uh, possession this product from Grant Thornton, dated 2014, who looked at alternative growth corridors in the um, uh, in England, and you can see there were several other alternatives, many radiating from London, but uh, a few away from London. And then after the report came out, um, John Reed Smart Growth UK uh, asked the question: Well, are there other arcs across the UK which are just as good as the Oxcam arc? And John relatively easily found at least five of them, just in England. He didn't look at Scotland and Wales. And these have all the advantages of the Oxcam Arc and few of the disadvantages. For example, there's much better public transport in many of these, the universe is just as good, housing is cheap, and labour is available. There's pretty full employment in the Oxcam Arc, so if you want extra jobs, you have to import the labour from elsewhere. And then more recently, still, the Catapult and uh, Centre for Cities report looked at growth hubs in the country and it also looked in Scotland and in Wales and it identified one growth hub in each of the regions outside the overheated southeast so it excluded the southeast and London but it found one growth hub possibility in the other regions easily. So the ARC is by no means unique and we have to question why is so much attention being devoted to it at the moment. Is it possible that the proposers of the ARC are mostly ex-students of Oxford or Cambridge universities. Here are all those growth proposals superimposed on each other. You can see there's quite a degree of uh, agreement between the alternative proposals over the last half a dozen years or so. The second myth about the Oxcam Arc, I'm not quite sure if you can see everything here, part of that screen's obscured, is that the Oxcam Arc or the developing art can at the same time save nature. And I want to spend the rest of this talk uh, showing the problems of that proposal. But first of all, we have to dig back into the Partnering for Prosperity report to see what's being threatened. Uh, I mentioned the million homes. This is a map in the same document in which the outlines, I'm outlining what is effectively the whole of Oxfordshire here, represent the different geographical units. The other outlines don't represent the ceremonial counties, but rather strange parts. Of them. So in Cambridge, you've got parts of Cambridgeshire and parts of um, Hertfordshire as well, for example, and not all of Cambridgeshire. This is the way Savills chose to model it. And as uh, Wendy pointed out, this area here, which I'm going to call Cambridge briefly, was uh, targeted with 271,000 of those million houses. 
The pie charts on this map show the distribution of houses. The pie charts add up to the million houses. And if we look just at Cambridgeshire, we've got three different colours on the pie chart. The pink represents currently planned homes, those in existing local plans for your area. In blue, we've got homes for London commuters. They're pretty upfront about it. These are homes for London commuters. And then the additional homes which would be unlocked by all Oxcamart developments. And you can see in Cambridge's case, it's not quite half. In the case of the other counties, it's more than half. So the, about two thirds of the total million houses are due to be unlocked by Oxcam Arc development. And the dark blue there, 23% of those million homes will be for London commuters. So it, we are going to be part of the dormitory donut, whether we like it or not. These are the percentage increase in the current total housing stock. Cambridge at the moment has just over 300, uh, about 330,000 houses, I think. So what's being threatened in these plans represents an 81% increase in your total housing stock to 2050. And the yellow across the map represents that for other places in Oxfordshire, our total housing stock will more than double if these plans come about. In the bottom right here, we have the Office of National Statistics estimate of the increase in the UK population. In fact, it's the increase in the UK households to 2050, 16%. So the question is, why is so much of the growth being concentrated in such a small part of the country? Why should the ARC suffer this level of expansion when on average the country is going to grow only by 16% to 2050? Two key documents about ARC developments appeared in February this year. One was called the ARC Spatial Framework, sort of beginning to lay out the plan for the spatial framework of the ARC and concentrating on economics, housing and the environment. And the other is the England's economic heartland. It's about a regional transport strategy. Now, I don't have time to discuss these documents in full. Uh, here's a link here to our website that discusses that document and to our website here. And there's a link at the bottom to a talk I gave uh, with more details on these plans. But the takeaway from these two documents is it's still a million houses. Although the documents refuse to say how many houses, the economic ambitions remain as they ever were. Those economic ambitions involve a million houses across the arc by 2050. It's still a million houses. As we saw in that earlier graph, the ONS predicts an increase in the UK population of about 16% to 2050. That 16% requires approximately 3 million more houses across all of the areas in white, the UK in this map here. One of those 3 million houses, 1 million of those 3 million, will go into the Oxcam Arc. And the question that arises really is why should one third of UK housing growth to 2050 go into less than 1 20th of the UK's land area, which the five Oxcam counties represent, with only 5.7% of the UK's population. It's an incredible amount of overdevelopment in a very small part of the country, which is already overheated economically. It doesn't make any economic sense. And the tragedy is today, there has been really absolutely no democratic engagement whatsoever of any of these ministries. We've got a few here. There are several more that I could add now. Uh, and the ministries and the ministers and their representatives simply are not talking to the 3.7 million people who live along the Arctic present and who will be most affected by this overdevelopment plan. We were told at a meeting uh, as recently as February by Chris Krasnowski, the portfolio director, this is a Whitehall plan. Other people said it's a creature of Whitehall. I know that local authorities after the cancellation of the expressway uh, were relieved and they said, well, that allows us to control our own development. No, it doesn't. This is still a Whitehall plan. And this is being looked after by number 10 and 11 Downing Street. This is one of Boris's priorities at the present time. So let's have a look at what silo thinking that I mentioned before proposes for the arc uh, that leads to the overdevelopment of the ox come up. We've had several different groups working in their silos on different aspects of uh, ox come up development. This first map here 
comes from Jim Hall's group, the ITRC group, that were looking at the best place for new settlements, new towns or expanded towns. And these are the areas shown in orange on the map here. And this area here near Milton Keynes isn't Milton Keynes. Milton Keynes is here, Bedford, it's the area between Milton Keynes and Marston Vale. Um, the development of already pretty well-developed areas or the expansion, for example, around Marlow here, um, considerable expansion there. Now, Jim Hall always emphasized that these are possible scenarios for growth, but basically uh, you could put the red patches in several different places um, and that's the plan for future communities. And then separately from that, we have the local nature partnerships, which are a collection of local authorities, local enterprise partnerships and wildlife trusts talking about environmental opportunity areas. And these are the sort of pale green areas here on this map. And they're defined as areas, as you can see, areas that might offer offsetting opportunities to developers. This is like saying to developers, come and help yourself to this land here. You've got to put a bit of cash in to improve the situation here, but it's an offsetting opportunity. We'll look at offsetting a bit later on. Now, you know this well enough. This is, these are the areas of outstanding natural beauty. In my area, you've got the Chilterns, you've got the green sand ridges. In your areas, you've got the fens. These are beautiful areas. They don't need improving, surely not. They're pretty good already. And strange enough, exactly the same map appears in uh, wildlife NGO literature described as core areas of existing high value for nature. These are areas that we really shouldn't touch with development. They don't need offsetting, they need protecting. And then another map that we can put on top of this is nature recovery networks. This is the dark green and the orange segments here. Now NRN's nature recovery networks are, are designed to join up the fairly patchy habitats of nature that we wish to protect. Uh, it's creating nature corridors, which is an idea from John Lawton's Making Space for Nature document of 2010. And then finally, of course, we can look at the plans for transport across the region. And fairly recently, England's Economic Heartland came up with this map of, this is a map of 10 of 13 in total road corridors across the arc that they want to enhance or improve to improve the transport links across the corridor. Now you can, and these are the oblongs of different colours. Now you can see those oblongs of different colours cut right across everything else under the map. And if there's one thing that stops us joining nature up in nature recovery networks, it's infrastructure, it's roads, it's railways. So the conclusion is we really can't have it all. We can't have all of these things. This is a product of silo mentality, four different silos, developing the same area and they're simply incompatible with each other. The question is how much of each of these do we need or do we want? The history of our production of nature is really rather a protection of nature as a settling. So the early protection of the environment uh, set aside through legislation, sites of special scientific interest, uh, sites of active conservation, SACs and so on, they were protected by law. And then planning laws gave a, a lower level of protection to other areas such as green belts because of their public health and their amenity values, especially, of course, in your towns and cities. Now, the problem is that as we develop pressure on land for infrastructure, for example, HS2 or housing in green belt, was resolved by relaxing or simply ignoring the rules of the exceptional circumstances clause, for example, of the National Planning Policy Framework. And that raised the question whether or not inevitable habitat destruction in some places, green belts or HS2, could be compensated for by protection or development elsewhere. This is where the ideas of offsetting and net biodiversity gain uh, 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 came from. Now, if you're going to offset or look for gain, you need a metric to measure how well you're doing. And this is where DEFRA's biodiversity metric that we'll look at in a minute comes from. And then an alternative way of looking at the impact on nature was to do natural capital accounting, which puts a monetary value on gains and losses. Uh, this allowed nature to be brought into an economic framework in a way that the biodiversity metric, which has no units to it, uh, does not. So let's have a look at uh, biodiversity offsetting, the, the, the simplest of it, biodiversity offsetting. This is from a, a DEFRA document 
And it explains three scenarios. Scenario A is the easiest. And it makes the point that if you're going to develop, we have an area of land here represented by one tree, uh, a developer wants to build houses. Now, the first instruction is you have to avoid harm. Avoid harm if you can, reduce harm if you can, enhance the building site if you can. And in scenario A, whereas we had uh, trees here, uh, at the end of development, we have houses, but we have more trees. So in this case, we've got on-site offsetting. We've offset the houses by developing nature on-site. That's scenario A. It's going to be a rare one, I think. Scenario B, we have nature to begin with here. We want to build houses. Uh, we can allow a few trees on the building site, but not as many as the ones we chopped down to build the houses. So we have to have some compensatory habitat creation elsewhere, which is the offsetting scheme to make up for the loss due to the housing. And in theory, that offset site should be close to the development site so that the local communities can still enjoy the amenity value of the offset site. The tragedy will come when we have exactly the same scenario as scenario B, but in this case, there are no local sites for offsetting. In that situation, the developer has to pay a tariff, a cash sum, and that cash sum can be spent anywhere in the country, elsewhere, a long way away, for conservation measures. You can uh, rewild somewhere. But of course, in that case, local community experiences all the pain of development and sees none of the gain of offsetting. For the Oxcam arc, no development equals no funds for nature. Absolutely, there aren't any free funds for nature. You've got to pay for the development of nature by losing some of it for development. Now, biodiversity offsetting can be likened to taking Westminster Abbey, turning it into a pile of bricks, moving the bricks elsewhere to the offset site. Here we are arriving on the offset site, leaving the pile of stones there and saying it's the same. Of course it isn't the same. It isn't the same and it never will be the same probably. It's going to take tens or even hundreds of years to regrow and that isn't certain. Success isn't certain. So we destroy part of nature and we hope to improve other parts of nature to make up for our destruction. Offsetting is a certain destruction of habitats in one place with the uncertain hope of reconstructing it elsewhere with a net gain. Uh, there have been many reviews of offsetting. We haven't done much offsetting in the UK, but it's been practiced a lot in America and on the continent. And you can see here the reviews of offsetting aren't very optimistic. Offsetting has often failed to achieve the objectives. In Australia, for example, the idea that there should be no net loss of biodiversity, well, what they're saying here is going to take at least 140 years for the offset sites to be as good as the sites that were developed, that were destroyed for development. We've got had very limited experience. There was a, a, a review of some pilot offsets in the UK and concluded the markets were immature. Uh, the interesting comment here is why these fail. First of all, there, was a, 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 there weren't suitable offset sites and there was an unwillingness of developers to pay for the full impacts. And those are going to be critical in Oxcom Arc development, as we're going to see in a minute. And then a couple of years ago, there was a, a huge review of global uh, projects for offsetting by the Durham Institute of Conservation and Ecology in the University of Kent. They looked at, as you can see, they looked at 15,000 published articles that mentioned offsetting. And from those 15,000, there were really only 32 studies with quantitative data from which they could measure whether or not no net loss was achieved. So basically, you're only replacing what you take away. There's no gain, but there's no net loss. And the studies that they did look at covered a, a, a huge area of land, in fact, 2% of the global offset areas. This is actually quite a large sample size, considering we're talking about the global um, ecosystem. And these are the results. The critical one was one third of those projects achieved no net loss. That's the green column here. Two thirds did not, that's the other one. They had either, they didn't achieve it or they had mixed outcomes or it couldn't be discerned whether there was uh, an improvement at all. 
only one third of projects agreed net, uh, no net loss. Wetland studies tend to have good outcomes, but there was net loss in all of the studies that involved forests, all of them. This isn't a very good track record for offsetting. And Dieter Helm in a webinar in 2019 said, no one has yet achieved net environmental gain at scale. Now we're going to look at the DEFRA biodiversity metric. I want to show how flawed it is a measure of what we're losing on the development site and what we might be gaining in the offset site. And I'm going to talk you through how to calculate it. And there are lots of lines on this slide, but let's take it one at a time. What you as a developer would have to do is identify the, the, the site that you want to develop. We're going to imagine developing 10 hectares of upland calcareous grassland. You need to know the area and within the calculation of the metric, you can have one of 133 defined habitat types. And then you have to decide, or your ecologist has to describe, that decide the habitat distinctiveness, which is rated as G here. And if your habitat's not very distinct, you don't need to compensate for it at all. If it's very distinct, then you have to compensate. So there's a, a high weighting factor here. Is it a distinct habitat? What condition is it in? If it's poor, the factor is one. If it's good, the factor is three. We're going to multiply these together in just a second. And then is it connected with other ecological units? Obviously, if it's unconnected, that's a low value. If it's highly connected, it's a slightly higher value. These numbers are very strange, but they're the numbers that DEFRA has chosen to use. And then is it a strategically significant site within local nature strategies? So your ecologist assesses all of those things. You see the numbers here, the area, and then this component, of that, and the metric is simply the multiplication of all those uh, figures together. So we're developing 10 hectares of upland calcareous grassland. These are the figures from the spreadsheet that DEFRA provides. You multiply that by all these numbers, and the total is 189.7. This is the metric for your development site. Now you have to more than offset this amount of biodiversity in an offset site. We're going to develop all of our 10 hectares for houses. So we have to carry out exactly the same calculation observations for the offset site, but importantly, we have to add two additional factors. And the two additional factors are, first of all, how difficult will it be to grow this particular habitat on the site? If it's very difficult, then we have a factor. Point one. If it isn't difficult at all, then we have a factor of one. For this particular habitat site, it has a difficulty factor of 0.33. And the second factor we need is the temporal multiplier. Basically, if a site takes a long time to reach maturity, then uh, we have a very low factor. For example, a deciduous woodland would take a very long time to grow. If it takes only a year, then we have a high factor. For this particular habitat, it's a factor of 0.49. So if we set aside 10 hectares of offset land to grow the same uh, uh, habitat type, then we'd need to multiply now all these factors together to get our biodiversity metric of 10 hectares of offset site. And notice these two additional factors here, difficulty and the temporal problem of growing that, mean that instead of 189 biodiversity units, we get only 30 units for a site of the same physical size. So what's the developer supposed to do? Because he is obliged to provide a net gain in that activity. The only thing he can do is to grow or to grow, to offset a much larger area of land. And remember, the new environmental bill requires 10% biodiversity gain. So again, I'm not sure if you can see the figure at the bottom of the screen, but to achieve net gain of 10%, the 189 units needs to be over 200 units. And to do that, you have to find 68 hectares of land to offset with exactly the same habitat type that you're destroying 10 hectares of to develop. This is a huge ratio, this is a huge increase. And I'm really not sure developers are gonna be very happy finding that amount of land to pay for offset, effectively to pay for offsets of that amount of building lands. And the ARC University Group wants there to be a 20% net gain, not a 10% net gain. That would require 74 hectares 
in exchange for 10 hectares of development land. So like for like offset, we're trying to grow the same habitat here, like for like offset is not area for area offset. You're going to need a very much larger offset area. And the question is, do, does this amount of land exist? Is it available? So the criticism of the biodiversity metric is, first of all, it's not measuring biodiversity at all. It's measuring habitats. And habitat is taken as a proxy for biodiversity. And quite frankly, it's a very poor proxy for biodiversity. It's a very rough and not very ready measure of proper biodiversity. The second thing is that these offset areas under the environmental bill have to be managed by covenants of 30 or more years. And those covenants have to be paid for by developers and probably will be carried out by wildlife NGOs. They'll be in charge of running that covenant, make sure the offset habitat grows as it's supposed to grow for 30 plus years. That's a pretty enormous cost that developers will have to pay. Now, the offset land, you've got to find land for offset. It's going to be unavailable for any other purpose. A farmer, for example, happy to lose, say, a terminate field for offset, is going to lose that field forever because you have to offset for 30 years. And then, of course, it's no good offsetting for 30 years and then the bulldozers come in and build houses. You haven't achieved net gain. So effectively, the landowner is selling the land under covenant to be developed for offset forever. It seems, as I said, from the numbers we looked at, it seems unlikely that there will be enough off offset land locally available. Communities will lose their amenities and see no net gain in their habitats. They'll just see housing. Now, I mentioned the alternative approach, natural capital accounting, which tries to bring nature into the economic framework. The biodiversity metric has, has been, it's a, a dimensionless unit. Uh, natural capital accounting allows us to put pounds and pence values on it. So let's imagine dear William Wordsworth wandering in Ullswater thinking about daffodils and horror of horrors, Ecobones, a company with fantastic green credentials. You've seen the brochures. It wishes to build a waste incinerator in Ullswater. So the natural capital approach would be, let's look at what we've got at the moment through Wordsworth's poem, and let's see what the natural capital value of that is. Now, um, floating over vales and hills. Well, vales and hills have amenity value. We like to walk in them. And it has pl flood prevention values. It prevents floods from downstream. So a value is put on that, 500 pounds, let's say. These are arbitrary numbers, but quite frankly, most of the numbers seem to be arbitrary. And then later on, a host of golden daffodils, well, we can pick those and sell them. So they have a market value of 50 pounds. Uh, beside the lake, well, water companies are very interested in lakes, uh, so they have a very high value. Let's put a value of a thousand pounds on the lake. Beneath the trees, well, trees can be used for timber, or they have amenity value. We chop them down for wood, or we like uh, having picnics underneath them. And then finally, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Well, the breeze is good for public health because it takes away pollution. So we'll put a value of 100 pounds. So the natural capital value of Wordsworth's Old Water is 1,850 pounds. And it's a per annum value. That's quite important. It's what we're going to call later on a yield from the natural capital in Ullswater. Let's say EcoBurns, the waste incinerator company's benefits would be 2,500 pounds a year. It's more than the natural capital value from leaving the habitat as it is. You can switch, see where the argument's going, can't you? Well, if, if incinerating waste produces more yield than leaving it as it is, incinerating waste just might win. Let's go back to the ARC documents, the spatial framework document, to show just how severe this argument's going to be. On page two of this document, they give us the figure, some is estimated, I don't know how, the total ecosystem services across the ARC each year. It's 2.27 billion pounds per year. It's important, it's an annual figure. And you remember that economic prize I mentioned, the economic output, the growth of the economic output, is between that and that. And everybody always talks about the bigger prize here for the transformational development of the ARC involved in the million houses. So it's 2.27 billion ecosystem services, but potentially 163 billion of economic increase. 
And any economics 101 text will tell you, well, there wouldn't really be any harm in completely concreting over the arc, losing this 2.27 billion, if you had to pay for it out of 163 billion, you'd still have a net value of 161 billion each year from concreting over the arc. What are we doing wrong here? Something's going wrong here because we are undervaluing nature and we are overvaluing our, the importance of economic output. The problem is that both of these sums here are yields. And if you think of the analogy of a fishery, when we go out fishing, we take the yield from the fishery and we hope not to reduce the stock. But overfishing shows us that e if each year we take out too much yield, we actually reduce the stock and eventually the fishery stock collapses. That's exactly what's happening in global economic systems. And that's explained in great depth by the Das Gupta review, which came out recently, all 600 pages of it, and is much more clearly explained more succinctly by products from your Bennett Institute in Cambridge, these three documents here. Now, the point that both documents make is that we have to distinguish between yields and stock. Again, think of the stock as the stock of fish in the sea, and the yield is how much we can take off each year without diminishing the stock. What both of these documents make the point is that we have three forms of stock. They're called capital in this, uh, uh, in this graphic, but we have capital stock, our factories, we have natural stock, the ecosystem, we have human stock, the people who produce things in the factories and enjoy the nature. These are the stock, and then each of those has some aspect of yields. So our natural capital provides ecosystem services, the capital stock produces the yield of goods and services, and so on and so forth, and also the ecosystem provides our food. And then in the process of manufacturing things and ingesting living, of course, there's pollution which has an impact mostly on the natural capital. And what you've got to realize is that for the last century, all of our economics has concentrated on a one factor in that very complicated graph, and that is the yield factor of produced capital, gross domestic product or gross value added. We've concentrated on this to the exclusion of more or less everything else, and certainly to the exclusion of the impact we're having on the natural stock of planet Earth. Estimates vary, but it's estimated that we're using natural resources at 1.6 planet Earth capacity at the moment. This cannot go on. We concentrate on GDP as the sole measure of economic success and sustainability. It isn't. It cannot be a measure of sustainability. The race for GDP has blinded us to the impact we're having on the stock of natural capital. And this single graph in Gas Gupta's um, document shows it very clearly. What we've got here is the percentage change in the capital stock the world is becoming wealthier. We have more wealth. This isn't the yield, this is the stock. Human stock has increased because the human population has increased, but both of those have been achieved, if you like, or attained in the face of a diminishing natural stock. This is the fishery. If we diminish it so far, the whole of the rest of the system will simply collapse. We cannot go on overexploiting the natural world in the way that we've been doing. So what Das Gupta and the, uh, 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 the Bennett Institute say is that we need to reassess economics and look at wealth. And of course, this is what the development goals, the sustainable development goals uh, are also talking about. The wealth is the stocks plus the yields of natural uh, and uh, human and productive capacity of the earth. It's a better measure of how well we are doing on planet Earth, because basically if the wealth stays constant or increases, then we're not diminishing natural stock and we can have a better standard of life. If the wealth diminishes, then we're on the road to extinction. So let's go and look at the arc's promise to double nature. This is embedded in the documents about improving nature across the arc. Remember, it's always conditional on development. Uh, various documents came out about how to double nature. And the very phrase doubling nature, of course, came from the Nature Cambridgeshire. Um, uh, Cambridgeshire. And there's the definition of putting nature at the heart of a development agenda. 
And the idea of doubling nature was then picked up by the art universities group with an environmental work group uh, embedded within it. And you've got the statement there of sustainable economic growth can be achieved and uh, we can also improve the environment across the art. We can call it the green art. We can have both. No, we can't have growth. We can't have both unless we do a lot more joined up thinking. Let's have a look at what the challenge of doubling nature would be just in your county, Cambridgeshire. The question is what you want to double. This map shows the legally protected areas of Cambridgeshire. You've got the green belt around the city here. You've got um, um, sites of special scientific interest in red, especially areas of conservation, RSPB reserves, local nature reserves and national nature reserves, all in the outline polygons. And looking at that map, the conclusion is, well, there's, there's not much there, is there? It really isn't very much to double. That should be easy. Uh, that should be easy. I talked with uh, Rupert Maysfield of the RSPB recently. He pointed out that the Environmental Working Group is now looking not just at these legally protected sites, but at something called priority habitats, defined by Natural England, as you can see there. Most threatened, the ones are which require conservation action under the Biodiversity Action Plan. Now, there's more habitat here, certainly, but again, it's equally and worryingly patchy. There aren't very large patches of anything there. Uh, to zoom into your city, for example, uh, there are the patches around your city. You might need some names on that. So here you've got some names, you can locate things. And again, there, it's a really patchy situation. Wildlife doesn't like patches. It's very, very bad for survival. I've looked at the priority habitats across the five counties of the arc. So you've got the five counties, the different colours here, and the histograms are, in this case, the percentage, in fact, the total percentage of each of these counties, which is covered by these different sorts of habitat types. So across the arc, deciduous woodland is by far and away the most abundant, it occupies between 5% and uh, just under 8% of the different counties. There's not much of anything else. Um, uh, there really isn't much of anything else. This is the totality of each of these habitat sites. The worrying thing is that if we look at the average patch size of each of those habitats, so you've got 7%, for example, of bucks is deciduous woodland. What's the average size of a deciduous woodland patch in Buckinghamshire? Here we've got the average patch size here of that woodland in Buckinghamshire, it's one hectare, this unit here. And in fact, although there wasn't much grassland altogether across the arc, where you've got grassland, you've actually got bigger patches of it across all five counties. These are very, very small patches. And in fact, the yellow line there is one rugby pitch. It's one hectare. That's the size of most of the habitat patches across five counties. Nature is in a pretty drastic and dire situation across five counties. This is before we add the million houses and all the infrastructure to go with it. The importance of a, a small habitat patch is shown here. This is a very classic ecological relationship it's called the species area relationship. As the habitat patch size increases, you get more species. The reason is at very small habitat patch sizes, extinction rates are high and colonization rates are low. So life doesn't do very well in small patches. It does slightly better in larger patches. Um, when the size of your patch is a rugby pitch, clearly you can't have many elephants or buffaloes living in it. You might have a few insects. In, in 2010, John Norton's Making Space for Nature asked for a billion pound annually with no strings attached to protect and enhance nature. Not a great deal of money in the National Exchequer. He wanted to make nature bigger, better and more joined up. Ten years later, he wrote to the Prime Minister in September last year, pointing out how little has been achieved in the interim and repeating his request for no strings attached funding for nature. Trouble is, with the net gain and natural capital approaches we're being encouraged to take, some parts of nature may be improved, but only at the cost of losing other parts of nature to development. Let's look at the conclusions. First of all, the Oxcombe Art isn't unique. There really are other places with equal or better potential. Squeezing a third of all housing growth in the UK to 2050 into less than 5% of the UK land area 
doesn't make any sense at all and puts huge pressures on the existing resources across the art. That silo mentality has led to non-joined up thinking across transport, infrastructure, uh, nature, and so on. We need more holistic and joined up thinking. Biodiversity net gain is suspect. Natural capital accounting concentrates on yields and not stock. The global experience with both net gain and no net loss is very poor. UK experience is limited, outcomes are poor. We need better methods of accounting for human, natural and capital yield and stock, in other words, wealth, because only that will lead to real sustainability. The silo thinking suggests we can have it all. In fact, of course, we can't. Doubling nature from a very sparse base is going to be extremely difficult indeed. So we need not just bigger, better and more joined up nature, which was John Lawton's plea. We need bigger, better and more joined up arc thinking at all. And this is the view that I think many of us have of the beautiful countryside between our two beautiful cities. Uh, and this is the danger of what it might become if the arc develops as proposed. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks very much. It's really hugely informative, David. Thank you. We're going to move into um, questions now. Well, here's one question came, came in. What, why do you think wildlife trusts and other so-called environmental NGOs are going along with the doubling nature argument? Um, well, I think um, the reason I, I've been given is that they think this is going to go ahead that it's better to be inside the tent trying to affect things than outside the tent throwing things into it. Um, I think both of those are wrong. I think um, this thing doesn't have to go ahead. It can be stopped. We stopped the expressway. People have said that 2021 is a critical year for the arc, and I see a lot of unjoined up thinking between the different components of the arc. I think it's actually in a weak state at the moment. And although the um, spatial framework document is launched with a great hoo-ha-ha, um, I don't really see any signs that um, a lot of progress is going to be made on it uh, with everything else the government's um, uh, obsessed by at the moment. But the Wildlife Trust are taking part, CPRE is taking part, trying to make the least worst outcome of something they think is inevitable. But, but you think it's not inevitable? I think I think it should be stopped. Uh, why should we put a third of total development into less than 5% of the land? And when you look at that statistic, it doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, you're an, an experienced campaigner and somewhat successful campaigner. And in a sense, we've got a campaign on our hands and somebody asks, um, we need to avoid silos in our response. There are 3 million people affected and there's been no public consultation. Yep. The goal must be to link up all those within the three million who oppose the ARC. Yes. How do we set about doing that? Well, they could join the No Expressway group. We have, um, we have a subscription list of three and a half thousand supporters at the moment. Um, we send out periodic newsletters. We started off life simply raising awareness of a scheme that virtually nobody knew anything about. We gave talks in villages across the arc and we talked about 40 different communities. They were horrified when they found out what was proposed and uh, we didn't find a single community in favour of it. The communities really don't want this to happen and if we gather together with a loud enough voice we can stop it. I really think we can stop it. I think it's a very fragile suggestion at the moment and we can stop it. Well, that, that, that's very encouraging. We're not against growth, Tony. I must emphasize, everybody says we need houses, don't we? Of course we need houses. We just don't need to double housing stock in 20 years. For in Cambridge, for example, you, you need 16% more houses for all your children and your grandchildren for 2050. That's all you need, 16%, not 81% increase. In Cambridge, we have a, here's another question. In Cambridge, we have an absurd situation where the university sits as part of the executive on the planning authority, the Greater Cambridge Partnership, and have huge vested interests because of their ownership of land for development. Yes, 
Yes. Have you avoided this in Oxford? No. We, how we, can we get no. this situation changed? We haven't. Uh, we've got some dreadful examples in Oxford. They're as dreadful as I'm sure they are in Cambridge. For example, St John's College in Oxford um, claimed it wanted to build 90,000 square feet of business space just outside Oxford City, ideal for social housing. 95,000 square meters of uh, business space and only 500 houses. The business space will accommodate four and a half thousand workers. Now, I know your commuting journey into Cambridge is dreadful. In Oxford, you can wait an hour on the A40 west of Oxford to get into Oxford City. The North Oxford development is at the end of that hour journey. Uh, it doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. The, the, the colleges have land in Oxford on the Green Belt too, uh, that they are trying to get out of Green Belt and put for development. 11,500 houses are scheduled for Greenbelt development in Oxford. I mean, it's, it's, it's been suggested that we, we need to um, raise the consciousness of the academics working within the university. And maybe there's a larger group who are opposed to, to development than we see from yeah. those who sit on the planning authorities. Do you think that's possible? I think that's actually essential. So it's certainly in Oxford, you see the people who take the decisions about college investments are the bursa and the college head. Now in Oxford, and probably the same in Cambridge, bursa and the college, they are actually employees of the college. The owners of the college is the fellowship. The fellowship employs the head of the college to the bursa. And the college fellowship is the one responsible for the college's resources. So if we could, um, interest the academics in taking a great interest in the development being done in their name, then we might get them to resist a little bit more in governing body meetings. I think there's a separation between the executive arm of uh, colleges and the academic arm. The, discussion, I, the discussions are simply not taking place because everything is being decided behind closed doors or of course by unelected bodies, local uh, enterprise partnership, LEPs. I was astounded to find that Oxford LEPs has about 200 employees. I haven't heard of any of them, and I certainly didn't elect them. And yet they're deciding the future of the county I live in. This is wrong. But here, here's a question about water. How do you increase water supply to cope with massive building development from an already depleted water system? Uh, Wendy and I have talked a lot about this, Tony, and um, I, if you read the water authorities or the water supply authorities documents, they have grand schemes for supplying water to 2080, affinity water and so on, uh, the combination of water authorities. And in the case of our region, they also claim they've modeled the increase of Oxcam Arc, the million houses, they say they can provide enough water for all those houses by 2080. Now they're relying on things like demand reduction, for example, more efficient machines, uh, that we should have showers rather than bars, that we should use rainwater rather than tap water, uh, that they should reduce leaks, for example, a demand reduction, and of course, supply increase. And the supply increase in this area is a combination of reservoirs. There's one route for Abingdon to supply London and the rest. And of course, piping water in from other watersheds, from the seven watershed into the Thames watershed. So the water supply companies regard supplying water as an engineering challenge. You just put pipes in and tubes in and you can supply the water. Whether or not they can supply it at the rate and quantity required is another matter, but their models say that they can. Whether they should, I think, is a much bigger question for society. Do we want this level of development here? Uh, what was interesting is that Paul Lenster, who's on the ecological group of the Art Universities group, pointed out the other day that the supply of fresh water isn't a problem. You really can pipe it in. The real challenge of art development is getting rid of the sewage, because sewage water is pumped into streams and rivers. You can't pipe that out to the Severn or pipe that up to the Abingdon Reservoir. You've got to get rid of it locally. And that, he said, was a bigger challenge, getting rid of wastewater than providing fresh water. Um, <clears throat> I think M Monica might come in on this point. Would you like to, Monica, and say one or two things about water in, in this area? Um, 
I mean, the only thing that I would add to that is that, yes, water companies say that they can supply um, through demand management, you know, reducing the amount of people use, yep. um, leakage reduction, yep. um, license trading, you know, buying, buying in bulk water from elsewhere. Mm. But the National Audit Office have found that actually they have failed to deliver on mm. all of those things. If you um on our website, um people who are interested, if you go to I think the issue over abstraction, you will find a link to the National Audit Office um report. And it, it says that, you know, water companies said five years ago that they would um they would achieve yeah. um for their users to reduce water consumption. In fact, the opposite has happened. Water consumption per capita has gone up. Hmm. Um, they said that they would reduce use um, leakage. Again, hmm. that just completely stalled. Nothing has happened. Hmm. Um, and then the third license trading. Well, Cambridge Water and Anglian Water are licensed trading in our area. Um, but basically to avoid accountability. So in, in North Stowe, it's Anglian Water who are supplying. They responded to the consultation um, as to whether they can deliver this water to these houses, and they didn't have a problem. Why? Because they're buying in bulk. Yeah. But who are they buying from? That they don't have to, to say. Mm -hmm. So they're actually buying from Cambridge Water, and yeah. Cambridge Water, of course, doesn't need to be consulted, and Cambridge Water is increasing abstraction and opening up a new borehole um, in order to deliver this, this water. when. The reality is the um, Environment Agency, a new report has found that actually in order to restore the health of our rivers and the health of the water in our environment here on the on the chalk aquifer, we need to be looking at reducing abstraction yeah. with a quantity of about 22 million litres per day. So that's where we are. It just none of it makes sense. And everybody is avoiding accountability. and. But basically, they, they, they just don't want to hear about water. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the, the reason for that, of course, is that whatever laws exist, they're, they're, the, the pencils aren't big enough. The water companies simply can ignore the rules and pay a minimum penalty. There, there are a couple of questions about the Environment Agency, which people are suggesting is not fit for purpose. Do you think? Um, more can be done to make the Environment Agency accountable? Well, I think you, you need to fund it. I think the, the funding of the Environment Agency has sort of halved, so they've lost personnel, they've lost the skills, they've lost the field work to monitor what's going on, for example, in water supplies and water quality. Uh, you, you have to increase the funding for the agency, and you have to make sure that the legislative teeth are enforced for breaking the rules. I mean, we have all the mechanisms in place, it seems to me, but we're just not enforcing the rules enough. We're not providing the enforcers with enough funds. There's, a, there's another question about, about the universities here. We've had some success in Cambridge in pushing colleges to divest away from oil and gas investments. Mm -hmm. This was done at least in part by connecting directly with fellows. Do you think it's possible to encourage colleges, both in Oxford and Cambridge, to divert capital into the natural environment? Um, I, yes, I do think they will. I think it's happening naturally. In fact, I was talking to an, an investor recently who says that um, over the last year, he's seen almost a sea change in people asking for investment in green, uh, green economies. Um, what's interesting is Miles Allen, who uh, talks about climate change a lot, he, he sits in with the discussions of many oil companies. Um, and when he challenges them, you know, what are you going to do about your carbon emissions? And they say, look, we could actually reduce our carbon footprint to zero. It's just that all the other companies would have to do it at the same time. It has to be global. We can do it technologically. It's easy, they say, but we're not going to be the first mover because we'll lose out. Wendy, have you got um, questions that you've noticed? Well, I just, I was looking at this thing about um, the nature recovery with, for example, with NEP, you know, the, you know, Isabella Trees 
yeah. rewilding project at NEP, you know, and they've got this wonderful project that's going. And then suddenly they've got this project, you know, for a, I think over three and a half thousand houses right next door to this yes. nature yeah. connectivity and nature recovery site. Yes. What is going on? I mean, this just seems so ludicrous. What do we do? We have, to, we have to shout loud. I mean, Nature Recovery Networks was essentially, it's a child of John Lawton's making space for nature, bigger, better, and more joined up. That's exactly what it's for. It's to make nature corridors so that an area that's um, suffering, for example, the wildlife can escape from it or an area that's growing, the wildlife can get to it. It's a very good idea, but it, uh, arranging them in the face of all the infrastructure that we've got, I think is very difficult. Nature, I mean, we are eating away at nature's stock and we're not aware of the long-term damage we're doing actually to ourselves, not to nature, but to ourselves. Um, we just have to shout louder. I mean, I think what's interesting is climate change has interested a lot of people. We're talking about avoiding something in 50 years time by doing something now. Uh, we don't seem to regard the destruction of nature in the same way. We can avoid a total meltdown of nature by doing something now. We're not doing as much for nature, it seems to me, as we're prepared to do for climate change we should be doing the same for both. The, one, the other question I just wanted to put to you was, was a question that I, I mentioned to Tony earlier, was, was about the issue of um, regulation and enforcement. Mm. It just seems to be, I mean, we've seen this happening with rivers and sewage. Yes. No enforcement, there's no regulation. Uh, that, that's a problem. I mean, you know, it's, it's point having rules if you don't enforce them, because also those who are breaking the rules will ignore them. We have to enforce the rules we've got. We have to make better rules. Um, I don't but, know what the answer is, Wendy, but if, if more of us make a fuss about it, at least people might start to listen. I, I, I wonder if um, you've, you've thought about East-West Rail, because yeah. we have a question about um, the, the East-West Rail plan being to start with diesel trains, which seems yes. remarkable. Have you got more to say about that, perhaps because of your work on the um, No Expressway? We're, we're looking, obviously, with interest at the East-West Rail because it, it, the original plan, it, it would be electrified. It would carry a great deal of freight, both of which we need, of course. Where it goes to in Cambridge is a, a different matter. Uh, what's happened recently is that, first of all, some of the feeder lines into East West Rail have been cancelled. So the Aylesbury East West Rail link has been cancelled for lack of funds. Uh, it's not going to be electrified. It's not all going to be electrified. So it have to be diesel trains or part diesel trains. And a diesel train's lifetime is about 30 years. So we're, we're committed to that. Um, in the good old bad old days of um, whoever was the transport minister at the time, he, he thought that hydrogen trains would come to the rescue. So he said, well, we can't afford to uh, in, install electricity, but if we get hydrogen trains, we won't need electricity. What I do understand is that they're building the bridges in East West Rail so that it can cope with retrofitting electricity if it's needed. Um, the, 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 the line is going to have freight loops, which you need when you've got a mixture of passenger and freight trains on it but it's not going to have as many freight loops as was originally planned. So again, the capacity for freight plus passengers will be less. Right at the beginning of the, 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 um, this evening, I, I raised the issue of cement. Yes. And uh, the need to reduce yes. building because of um, its implications for carbon emissions. Yes. And I think one of the things that's happening with an interaction with the East-West Rail and um, the um, guided bus routes in Cambridge oh, yeah. is, is that people aren't thinking about reduction. No. So they're going ahead with the um, guided busways, which is millions of tonnes of concrete. Mm. And that is then disrupting the planning for East-West Rail, which yeah. is then being pushed away from its, its, its preferred route. It's interesting. I had to come across the example that East-West Rail was racing HS2 to get to Calvert because nobody decided who would build their line first, whether one had to go over the other or the other had to go over the one. Um, one frightening statistic I read yesterday is that 70% of the global infrastructure we will have on planet Earth by 2050 
has yet to be built. 70%. That's an awful lot of concrete. Yes, and there's no way of uh, reaching um, zero carbon and, and conforming to the 2008 Climate Change Act if, if, if we carry on at that rate. There isn't. I mean, surely the cement industry basically you can capture carbon at the point of origin. It's difficult coming out of an exhaust pipe, but if you have a cement factory, it shouldn't be beyond the wit of human beings to have technology to extract that carbon at source. They, they can think of the uh, technology, but they can't do it by 2050 or in, in a reasonable time scale. I think that, that seems to be the problem. Mm -hmm. Andy has asked about uh, alternative ways of thinking about um, a demo democratic development. He says, could we think about an initiative involving citizens' assemblies to create an arc for nature mm -hmm. and people based on holistic, joined up, future living plant thinking? co-create an alternative plan and build a citizen's political representatives environmental NGO yeah. to support it. Yes, I think, they, I mean, yes is the answer, but uh, you know, where do you start? Uh, what, what is lacking across the arc, what we desperately need are a series of citizens assemblies to decide the future that we want, not the future that Whitehall wants to impose on us, but the future that we want. And if we collectively worked on that, I think we would be enormously powerful because we could say to Whitehall, you want this, but we want that. Uh, we would accept a certain level of development. We just don't want the hyperinflated development that um, simply an economic prize requires. It's it, economics driving this whole scheme. You know, I was earlier today at a meeting uh, talking about expansion of the, of the biomedical campus in Cambridge is looking to grow. Mm -hmm. And people were pointing out at the meeting, a lot of, you know, a number of people, um, that actually um, it wasn't going to be very green for them to do, do so. And I think people were quite surprised. I don't know whether Terry's got a view on this. Sorry, I didn't hear that. I was too busy um, responding to someone who was talking about aren't, aren't creating more jobs in Cambridge a good idea. And I was just pointing out that um, creating more jobs and houses leads to worsening congestion, more unaffordable homes and yeah. the highest inequality in Britain. So the last 10 years, the supposedly the growth miracle of Cambridge has been an absolute disaster for people living here. Certainly yeah. those on low incomes who, who provide all the services that these uh, the science park and the university needs. Well, certainly on, on the, um, you were talking about offsetting, David, and certainly there was um, the sort of key to oil companies, I interviewed Ben Van Burden, the chief executive of Shell, and he said, well, you know, we're going to get to net zero and we'll be planting trees on land the size of Spain. Well, mm. that's one oil company mm. uh, taken over the whole of Spain, however unrealistic that actually is. Mm. But um, there was an East uh, European Commission report on carbon offsetting done in 2016, and it said 85% of the project failed and did not deliver. There's mm. a huge, huge question mark. Everyone is racing into carbon offsetting from mm. the oil companies to the shipping companies. Mm. There is no guarantee. It's not formally regulated. Nobody knows whether these projects are really viable or not. And as you say, you really have to wait 30, if not 100 years to mm. know that that tree planting uh, mm. project that you've used to offset more oil um, consumption is actually mm -hmm. keeping carbon in the ground. So, yeah, I think there's a huge um, issue over all of these. I mean, you, you need you need much more government intervention, in my view. Um, you cannot leave it to the uh, private sector. Um, mm -hmm. Extinction Rebellion talk about system change. I mean, I, I yes, I've written a book which is coming out on May the twentieth, Crude Britannia. Um, it looks at a lot of these kind of issues, but I do. We did conclude after five years research and decades of journalism that um, it cannot be left to the private sector. There has got to be massive intervention yes. um, by policymakers to keep this on track. Companies are all short termist. They're all interested in what happens in the next three to six months, as are, are most investors. Those are not the people that the future of the planet can depend on. We're going to be moving now just towards winding up. We're coming to, walk to, to the end. Um, I think that I'd like to thank David hugely for 
your presentation. I think it's been very important for the 130 plus people who came to really put their minds to thinking about this amazing destructive uh, scheme across the whole area of, um, of, of, of this part of the country. And uh, as I think you said very clearly, David, it's, it's here because of the profit that can be made from building and land values. Yes. And it's not here because of the needs and benefits uh, to, to, to people. And maybe that's the clue, which um, it, of course it, ha it requires government intervention and of course it requires intervention from central government and local government. But in order for that to happen, many of the 3 million people across the arc have got to make that a priority and they have to, to push the policy makers yes. through a variety of actions, including direct action, to, to bring um, a change of view about. And if you have um, a final word for us. Um, I, uh, look, uh, thank you very much for letting me, me uh, uh, explain our work this end. What we've always lacked in the Oxford end is contact with the Cambridge end. We started off in a small village on the border with Buckinghamshire the first year. We spread into Buckinghamshire, then Bedfordshire in the second year. We gave a talk in Cambridge in the third year. And we always said, why can't we find a group in Cambridge with which we can, with whom we can work and spread the word? It really is raising awareness amongst those 3.7 million people, because whenever they find out about it, they're all horrified. And if you're horrified, you vote and you vote for people who aren't supporting this monstrous scheme. Um, we've already had uh, a whole local district council turfed out because he wanted to build too many houses on the green belt. And in the process of the local elections of targeting candidates who currently support the Oxcomark, we are tweeting and Facebooking posts that suggest that, um, well, letting people know they support the ARC and the overdevelopment. But I think we could, um, we need to organize ourselves in the grassroots. That's very difficult. But if we have anybody on this talk who wants to help establish uh, the Cambridge end of a movement against this overdevelopment, please do get in touch. Um, via the website, there's a uh, Gmail links to our, web, uh, to our email account. Well, so certainly Friends of the Cam are, are part of that yes. movement yes. here. And, 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 and that's... Yes. Part of our charter is is that overdevelopment has to be curtailed, yes. if not, and perhaps stopped. Yes. Um, so, th thank you. We're going to have a version of this um, of the talk available for people. We've re we've uh, saved the chat. Maybe we you can all save the chat, but maybe we'll be able to do a, a summary of that and pass that round too. Um, thanks to everybody who came, 130 plus came, and there's still 104 with us, and, and take the message and let's really do something about it. Thank you so much, David. And well, thank you very thank much. You thank, you, thank you, everybody, thank you. Uh, really. You helped with this oh. evening, and, and we're certainly- Thank you very much, David. We're partners you. with you, David. Thank, thank you. you, that's wonderful news. That's the best news tonight, Tony, thank you, really.